Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm Senior Minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church in downtown Minneapolis and moderator of the forum. Today's speaker is Deborah Archer, National President of the American Civil Liberties Union. First, though, we have something special to get things started. When forums were in person, we usually began with music. We wanted to bring that back in this virtual setting. As an opening for today's talk, we have a performance by jazz vocalist Thomasina Petrus, along with Tom West, Walter Chancellor Jr., Jeff Bailey, and Kevin Washington. Their musical set is closely linked to Deborah Archer's themes of race, civil rights, and the law, with pieces by Billie Holiday, Nina Simone, and Bob Dylan. It's presented by the Westminster Performing Arts Series, which engages the community with high quality performances that connect artist and audience collaboratively. This opening piece is about 15 minutes long. If you're in a hurry to get to our talk with Deborah Archer, you may skip ahead using the slider bar below. Otherwise, please sit back and enjoy our opening jazz performance. James Baldwin. All I know about music is that not many people ever really hear it. And even then, on the rare occasions when something opens within and the music enters, what we mainly hear or hear corroborated are personal, private, vanishing evocations. Ida B. Wells, the mother of the anti-lynching movement. The way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. <laughs> Southern trees bear a strange fruit. There's blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree. Pastoral scenes of the gallant song with the bulging eyes and the twisting. of magnolias sweet and fresh and then the sudden smell of burning flesh here here is a fruit for the crows to pluck for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the sun to rot, for the tree to drop. Here is a stream. And be Mother's nurse and 
I don't know how hot or cold your hands were when they touched those keys. Your pure love affair, uninterrupted, interrupted, with discords of ignorance and no knowledge of its radiance. This perfect pitch music that speaks to hearts and drowns out the irregular beats of batons and nightsticks and shoes running on pavement and thrown bricks. We must passion your knowing. We must pass she on. Your knowing through the voice of your true love's wooden body. And like the rings in its origin trunks, this love rings truth in its keys.
Never underestimate the wisdom and the ember of elders. The young only need to lean in close to catch fire. Greetings, this is the Westminster Town Hall Forum. 
My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church in downtown Minneapolis and moderator of the forum. For more than 40 years, the Town Hall Forum has invited speakers of conscience to address the issues of the day from an ethical perspective. That is thanks to the generosity of supporters. Donations from individuals make up 85% of the Forum's budget. If you are able, we would ask you to consider supporting the Forum, which you may do on our website, westminsterforum.org. Today's program is part of a special series called The Arc Toward Justice, taking stock one year after George Floyd's death. This month, we are presenting four talks by National Voices on Racial Justice. We're asking each person to reflect on where we are one year since George Floyd's murder and where they believe we need to go. We would like to thank the Minneapolis Foundation for being our presenting sponsor for this series. Our thanks as well to the Polad Family Foundation for co-sponsoring production of these programs. We also have several media partners supporting this series. Thanks as always to Minnesota Public Radio for recording and broadcasting our forum programs. Thanks as well to longtime media sponsor MinPost, a source for nonpartisan news coverage of Minnesota and beyond. Find more at MinPost.com. And we would like to welcome a new media sponsor of the forum, Sahan Journal. Sahan Journal provides news coverage that illuminates issues affecting Minnesota immigrants and communities of color and redefining what it means to be Minnesotan. Learn more and see their coverage at Sahan, S-A-H-A-N, sahanjournal.com. Today's forum will be guest moderated by Shonda Smith-Baker, Chief Impact Officer and Senior Vice President at the Minneapolis Foundation. On behalf of the Westminster Town Hall Forum, thank you for joining us today. And now please help me welcome today's guest moderator, Shonda Smith-Baker. Hello, my name is Shonda Smith-Baker and I am the Chief Impact Officer and Senior Vice President at the Minneapolis Foundation. I am pleased to be guest moderating today's Westminster Town Hall Forum with Deborah Archer of the American Civil Liberties Union. Deborah Archer was elected national president of the ACLU in January 2021, making her the first person of color to lead the organization in its 101-year history. She is the Jacob K. Javits Professor of New York University and the Professor of Clinical Law and Co-Faculty Director of the Center of Law and Inequality at NYU School of Law. She previously worked as an attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union and the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where her legal work focused on voting rights, employment discrimination, and school desegregation. She was a member of faculty at New York Law School for 15 years and an associate at the firm Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett. She previously served on New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board, the nation's oldest and largest police oversight agency. She has been recognized by the New York Law Journal as one of New York's top women in the law. Please help me in welcoming to Westminster Town Hall Forum, Deborah Archer. Thank you, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be in conversation with you today to join the wonderful speaker series that you have organized and to talk about, as you said, these really important issues that our country is facing this year. But today, right now, I wanna talk about belonging. America is fundamentally an idea, an ethos, a set of principles and demands. And the story of America is at its heart, a story of who belongs, who gets to benefit from the unprecedented wealth of this nation, who has access to the opportunities, the potential that being in America offers, who gets to live with safety and dignity, and who gets to receive the equal protection of the laws. And the story of America is also about who gets to decide who belongs and the tools we provide them to enforce those decisions. And in America, you cannot tell that story without understanding racism. Generation after generation, we strive to build an America where everyone can finally become full members of the American community. And at the ACLU, we say that we're fighting for an America where we the people means all of us. And what is so stunning about America, so heartbreaking, is how America resists this, how racism persists. 
it is powerful because it's evolving, because it's creative, um, because it adapts. America ratified the 15th Amendment and guaranteed Black men the right to vote. And then America responds with poll taxes, grandfather clauses, and voter ID laws. America makes Jim Crow and housing discrimination illegal. And then America responds with redlining, steering, and the school to prison pipeline. And America makes slavery illegal and then responds with mass incarceration, police brutality, and racial terror. So broadly, my work focuses on how racism is able to persist in its power, how it evolves, how it adapts. I try to identify and challenge the architecture of racial inequality and explore the laws, policies, cultural norms, and structures through which racism continues to constrain the life outcomes of some, but expand the life outcomes of others, and how racism mutates and changes and continues to make it clear to all of us who belongs and who doesn't. And for those of us who are engaged in this work, for those of us who care about racial justice, and for those of us who are living our lives as people of color in this country, the pain is not new. And yet the pain feels particularly raw right now. We are living through devastating yet remarkable times. These are devastating times because after every injustice, it feels like we're not given a minute to mourn before we're forced to move on to the next injustice. And on so many fronts, it feels like we're fighting the same fights those who came before us fought. But these are also remarkable times because we are having long overdue conversations about racism. In his famous poem, Let America Be America Again, Langston Hughes wrote, Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me. And in the past year, we have seen once again the power we have to drive change when all of us come together. We have the power to make America be America. Uh, now, this is, of course, a long and hard struggle, this fight to define who belongs, who doesn't, and who gets to decide. Frederick Douglass warned us that freedom wouldn't come easy. It takes constant struggle. It's a constant fight. He said, quote, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. And one of the most powerful strategies that proponents of racial justice use um, is to, opponents of racial justice use is to tell us that we have no reason to fight, that we have no basis for outrage, that we have to keep our protests in check. But we know from Frederick Douglass that this isn't true. The fight for freedom takes thunder and lightning. The fight for freedom requires the ocean's awful roar. And today, in this moment of possibility, we have reclaimed the beauty and power of black rage, forcing this country to face the physical brutality and violence of racism and the toll that it takes on victims' bodies and minds. We are demanding that our fellow Americans face the political social, economic, and personal implications of life in a country that's built on the systemic undervaluing of Black people and Black communities. We are seeing today the beauty of rage as a powerful tool of resistance. For Black people in America, racial oppression can feel omnipresent. It is nearly impossible to evade the brutal force of white supremacy. And rage is a natural and justifiable reaction for people who have reached their breaking point after trying to survive under multiple layers of discrimination and violence and indignity. But rage is not only an expression of pain, but a call to action. It demands that America face its racism, making the invisible pain of Black people visible and amplifying the voices of those silenced by oppression and white supremacy. Rage and the urgency, anger, and exhaustion that animate it has driven demands for justice, helped to build and sustain movements, and led to meaningful progress for decades. Rage is a thread that runs consistently throughout American history, from slavery to the civil rights movement um, and the Black Power era to today, and has helped to inspire uprisings and protests that have incentivized critical political action. And this tradition includes 
rebellions by enslaved people who fought for their freedom. It includes Bloody Sunday, when hundreds marched in Selma, Alabama, demanding voting rights. And that demand helped to spur adoption of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And it includes urban uprisings in Watts, Newark, and Detroit that led to adoption of the Fair Housing Act of, of 1968. And following the killing of Black people, including Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Richard Brooks, that rage spread across the country and the world. And it animated the Black Lives Matter movement with protests demanding an end to racialized police violence and calling for an acknowledgement of the full truth of anti-Black oppression. I think today the nation continues to see the concrete results of sustained protest against racialized police violence. Over the past year, we are beginning to shine a piercing light on practices that are not only part of America's racist past, but that remain central to America's present dehumanization of Black bodies, Black communities, and Black identity. And by calling out the breadth of America's sins against Black people, we are finally locating the source of Black America's problems, not in Black people, but in the white supremacy woven into the fabric of America. And we are pulling on the thread that connects so much of America's systems, our laws and our structures, the need to control, regulate, and devalue black people. The need to tell us that we may have helped build this country, that we may have given our bodies in America's wars, that our culture animates what, so much of what it means to be Americans, but that none of that matters because we do not and will not ever truly belong. Shortly after emancipation, a group of black people from Mississippi wrote to that state's governor pleading that they do not want to be hunted. All we ask, they said, is for justice and to be treated like human beings. And black people are still making that plea. Slavery, America's original sin, is the first and clearest manifestation of the dehumanization of black people in the United States. Slavery was a system of theft. It was theft of life as people were stolen, enslaved, and brutalized. Slavery was theft of property and product through forced labor. It was the theft of identity and home as people were repeatedly ripped from the community and culture that are central to the human experience. It was theft of happiness, dignity, and potential. And once codified into law, slavery became imprinted onto the DNA of the nation and serves as the foundation of the architecture of racial inequality. And long after the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment put a formal end to the institution, the vestiges of its brutality lived on through lynching, through Jim Crow, mass incarceration, the racial wealth gap, and police brutality. And indeed, the legacy of slavery continues to reverberate today. And at each stage in this evolution, police have played a critical role in protecting power and enforcing racial hierarchy. Modern policing has its roots in slave patrols that suppressed slave revolts and hunted down enslaved people who tried to escape to freedom. Following emancipation, black people were pulled back into forced labor with shocking brutality through the criminal legal system and what was called convict leasing systems. Communities created categories of crime as a pretext to arrest black people, or they just arrested them without the pretense of having committed a crime at all, and court sentenced them back into forced labor. And during Jim Crow, police brutally enforced segregation, and police officers often joined, supported, and protected lynch mobs. During the civil rights movement, police beat protesters who marched for equality on national television. And when black people dared to move into historically white neighborhoods, police were enlisted to ward off residential integration and protected the people who terrorized black families. Today, police brutalization of black people is captured on camera phones and body worn cameras on what feels like a daily basis. And law enforcement still operates today to control black people through a system characterized by a deep seated and systemic racism a failure to recognize the fundamental humanity and dignity of black people, and the conflation of brown skin with dangerousness, criminality, and inhumanity. The result is a system in which black people are disproportionately killed by the police, stopped by the police, arrested by the police, 
and more likely to experience physical and emotional harm from the interactions with the police. The question we must ask ourselves is whether the conversations we're having about race today will finally transform the system. And I fear that change is gonna be limited. We are still too often looking in the wrong places and asking the wrong questions, which lead us to the wrong answers. We are focused on the specific act of injustice before us, thinking about how we can correct that individual wrong and then feel like we've accomplished everything when we hold one person accountable for an evil act. But the actions of an individual bad guy, their evil caught on camera for the world to see, that's not the full story of racism. For most people living in America, racism is not Bull Connor sticking his dog on black children, seeking to integrate public schools while hurling racial slurs, or a lone police officer who murders a black person. This understanding of racism as the actions of individual racist people overlooks the centuries long impact of race-based laws, policies, and practices that have caused and perpetuate racial inequality. It misses the racism of sending your children to an under-resourced, heavily segregated public school, which constantly underprepares its students for college and life and puts them on track for involvement with the criminal legal system. It misses the racism of living an hour and a half away from decent jobs because your community is ill-served by public transportation. And it ignores the racism of a lack of access to supermarkets providing affordable and healthy food while your children are sick because they're exposed to environmental stressors, but you can't access regular health care. It ignores a long time damage to black neighborhoods which were ripped apart through highway development and systemic underdevelopment at an incalculable cost to black wealth, health, and community. It will be difficult, if not impossible, to find a single actor responsible for these harms, and even less likely that there is explicit evidence that any current actor in any system was predominantly motivated by racial animus. But the harm is done, the exclusion is manifest, and these are all faces of racism. And this focus on explicit acts of racism by so-called bad actors presumes that by eliminating the aberrant behavior of a few bad apples, will root out bias within our systems. And that limited understanding of racism means that we're using tools that are too small and too narrow to be effective. And it means that we're not acting in a way that challenges the many ways that racism persists in its power to exclude and to destroy. We saw that in the wake of Derek Chauvin's conviction for murdering George Floyd. Protesters have been demanding justice, not only for George Floyd, but for Breonna Taylor and Jacob Blake and for all the names to come. But what we have seen was individual accountability. That's necessary, it was important, but it's not justice. Derek Chauvin's prosecution was framed as an individual bad apple whose behavior was far outside the norm. And despite that, his conviction was possible only after a Herculean effort where the murder was taped by a young girl witnessed by people, um, other first responders who tried to intervene, and that it lasted for almost 10 minutes where people can see every opportunity to save his life. It was possible only after historic marches around the world demanding accountability, after many police officers broke the brew wall and stepped in to testify in favor of his conviction. And only happened because the world was watching because it was televised. Without that perfect storm of factors, it leads us to question whether there would be accountability at all, much less justice. Derek Chauvin was found guilty, but there was no convictions for the officers who murdered Breonna Taylor while she slept in her bed, or for the officers who killed Daniel Prude while he was experiencing a mental health crisis, and the officers who shot Jacob Blake in the back multiple times in front of his children is back on the job. And across the country, Protests against police brutality were met with the very violence people were protesting, with officers punching, kicking, gassing, pepper spraying, and driving vehicles at protesters. While I hope the guilty verdict against Derek Chauvin brings some measure of peace to the people who love George Floyd and to his community, it doesn't address our country's long history of police abuse against communities of color. It does not speak to the systemic inequality 
that allows our criminal legal system to remain one of the most powerful tools of white supremacy. As we all breathe a little deeper and experience the joy and relief of Derek Chauvin's conviction, we have not begun a full reckoning on policing. And these highly publicized examples of police encounters that result in the death of un un unarmed people are only a small piece of a much larger story that includes routine assaults, humiliation, degradation, and disrespect of people of color. Indeed, George Floyd's murder is an extreme example of the type of violence and abuse the police have visited on black and brown people every day for decades. The system of policing that we as a country have built permits and normalizes this racialized brutality. People have not been marching to see more police officers in, in jail. They have been marching to stop police killing and brutalization of black people and for black people to feel safe in their community and everywhere else. Accountability provides some measure of comfort after the harm, but justice comes before and prevents the harm altogether. So what we need now is transformation. We have to renew our conviction to create a society where police do not have the opportunity or authority to use violence and harassment to target black people, to kill black people, to let us know that we do not belong. Yes, we've seen changes on the edges, but not the kind of fundamental structural change we know these repeated incidents call for. And in the meantime, lives are being lost and destroyed every day. And I didn't wake up this morning any less worried about the lives of my black sons. We must take immediate steps to root out the racism that undergirds our system of law enforcement. We must prohibit police mistreatment and police occupation of communities of color, which leads to people being both underserved and over-policed. True transformation would mean that police are not the only resort for addressing harm. It means removing police from the enforcement of low level offenses that should not be criminalized. We need to do more to shrink the footprint of policing in our communities and invest in the resources and institutions that will allow communities to thrive. Affluent white communities already live in a world where they choose to fund youth, health, housing, and education as their primary investment in community health and safety. These communities have lower crime rates, not because they have more police, but because they have more resources to support the health and well-being of their community in a way that ultimately reduces crime. They don't criminalize their children. They design their own lives so that they walk through the world without having much interaction with police at all. And we need to identify and unravel the bias that leads us to believe the same is not possible in communities of color. We are using the police to manage the problems that our unequal system has produced. And instead we have to invest in meeting those challenges and needs head on. Today we have defunded education. We've defunded affordable housing. We defunded public transit and environmental safety. We've abolished voting rights protections and we've divested from the things that make our communities healthy, happy, and safe. And then we say that we need to increase our investment in policing to deal with the consequences. We know that the road forward isn't simple and true freedom, true inclusion, true equality will not be given easily. It will take every bit of rage, every bit of ingenuity, every member of our community to ensure that we continue to move forward. Progress will be halting as it always is. For every two steps forward we take, we should expect to take one step back. But we have a moment of opportunity now, a moment when the world is watching, when our children are watching, to demand better, to stand up and to do better, to say that our children matter as much as your children, that our dreams matter as much as your dreams, and that our lives matter as much as your lives. Toward the end of his poem, Langston Hughes makes a promise. And it's a promise that we are called upon to embrace every day. He says, America, oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to your questions. Yeah, what a powerful sort of overview of what's happening. I went from... Um, thinking quite a bit about belonging to thinking um, quite a bit about what's possible. And 
I guess I would ask you, um, and, and you touched on this a little bit, but what feels different in this moment? Because you've laid out other moments in history, but what feels different in this moment? Yeah, um, it definitely does feel different. This is a problem that we face time and time again. Uh, some of it, I think, of course, has to do with COVID. Mm -hmm. Because of COVID and the lockdowns, uh, we were all at home, focused on the news and feeling a sense that we were engaged in a collective endeavor as these killings unfolded. I also think that people are really truly done with the cycle of police killing protests, then empty promises, then back to police killings. Uh, I think they're tired and they have decided that they're not going to rest until they see more than the kind of empty promises or reforms that tinker at the edges that they've seen before. And I certainly am grateful to everyone who has continued to take to the streets every day to demand change. I think we're also seeing preparation and opportunity coming together in a really powerful way. People were ready for this moment because of the work of activists and organizers and lawyers over many, many years. Uh, we're seeing the work of uh, so many people who worked on racial justice long before this moment. Artists had films and scholars had books and articles. Advocates had policy platforms, um, resources. They had educational materials. Legislation was already in the pipeline. Litigation had been planned. And then finally, I think we see a broader and more intentional network of people with deep relationships in communities who are ready to do the work of supporting um, both the protests and the calls for transformation. It was a network and infrastructure and coalitions, I think, that were built and nurtured since the killing of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and Tamir Rice. Communities were constantly at work to make sure that um, they were ready for this moment. And the broader community is actually seeing um, impacted people, uh, Black people, people of color, as central to this movement and to this to this moment, and I think it's making an incredible difference. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, the broader community is recognizing their role differently? I, I think so, and I think if you're, you know, when you talk about recognizing their role, there are two different sides to that role. I think we are starting to have a conversation where the broader community is recognizing their role in, in terms of identifying the role that they play, either actively or passively, in allowing this type of um, individual bias and systemic inequality and discrimination uh, to continue, that sitting by silently is contributing to the problem, uh, that people have privilege and that they're not using that privilege to challenge the system. And then in terms of um, the broader community seeing their role as having to be a part of the solution, again, both actively and passively, um, supporting financially, getting out in the streets, facilitating these conversations, ensuring that we are having the conversations that we need to have, that they're continuing to happen uh, long after Black History Month, continuing to happen every day and in places and spaces where we didn't normally have these conversations. Mm -hmm. The, you know, right after uh, the George Floyd uh, murder, our city council went out to the park and said we were going to defund policing in Minneapolis, and it's been a windy road uh, since then. But there's been language around uh, defund, abolish, you use the word transform. Um, and then, you know, in your uh, presentation, you laid out sort of elements of what it would take to realize sort of safer communities where people belong and are treated as such. Um, in terms of, of sort of the language that has been used, um, how does that um, sort of relate to the way that you're approaching um, the transformation of policing? Yeah, and the language is so important. The narrative, the stories, the language we use really helps shape not only the direction in which we move, but who feels that they can participate uh, in that conversation to be a part of that movement. When people talk about police abolition, which I think can um, get some folks to stop listening, I think it really is, um, it's a goal. And I think that the conversation around challenging systemic racism um, 
the reform and defunding are all about how we get there and what we need to do to get there safely. The calls for um, defunding the police, it, it doesn't mean that we're turning our backs on safety. It's about reducing the role of police and redirecting money to invest in people and communities, invest more in the money resources and institutions that are going to allow communities to thrive. So I think abolition is a broad project that focuses on getting rid of institutional racism and the relics of racism. And W.E.B. Du Bois, in his essay, Black Reconstruction in America, wrote about what he called abolition democracy and the need to create democratic institutions that would grant Black people full citizenship, political, economic, and social. And a modern manifestation of his theory, I think, is the abolition we hear about today, which is to imagine a world um, without X, X being prisons or police or homelessness or housing inequality, and then do the work to build that world by changing economic, social, and political conditions. And I think people speak of abolition as a goal, and they're calling on us to do the work to create a society um, where we can achieve that goal, where oppressive systems aren't aren't necessary. And so the the roadmap that I laid out, I think are some steps, not all the steps, I think other people would add others that will help us get to a point where we can envision a world where our policing system is not necessary, where we don't um, need to use police to enforce racial order, where we have built a system that provides political, economic, and social support for all communities so that they can be safe and happy without having police um, enmeshed in their, into their communities in the way that um, it happens now in communities of color. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think part of that conversation, as, as I heard you, was, um, or the laying out was the disinvestment that has happened in our youth and our schools and housing and all of the um, sort of infrastructure that allows for communities to flourish. And we know that there are systemic issues that are embedded there. But what struck me in those comments as I'm sitting here in Minneapolis is that our state, time and time again, has been noted as being one of the most charitable. Um, and um, it's often said we have 10,000 lakes, uh, we have 10,000 nonprofits, so there is an infrastructure here that would suggest that that infrastructure does exist, yet we have um, watched what has played out uh, publicly over the last year, which many people have lived um, for, for generations underneath um, a suppressive sort of system. So how, how can people, um, how can we help folks that have been quite generous understand perhaps the difference between generosity and justice? I, I, you raised so many important issues. I think we could talk for an hour about that, about that question. Um, and I wanted to go back to the very beginning of your question when you said that it's the, the you talk about the infrastructure of, um, of inequality that we've built. And that is so true because it is, it is the infrastructure of inequality. It is there as the foundation, uh, but it's hidden because so many other things are layered on top of it. And I think some of the nonprofits that you speak of, a lot of the racial justice work, the social justice work that we do is focused on those visible parts that have been layered on the infrastructure, trying to address the symptoms of the larger systemic problem. Uh, but I think it's, uh, at this point in time, we have to turn to really doing the work to um, identify that infrastructure, to then tear down that infrastructure that leads us to inequality, and then to build a new infrastructure that is the foundation for a more equitable and more just um, society. I think there are a lot of institutions recently that are speaking out against uh, racial divides that plague our communities and our economies, um, doing the work to help address some of the symptoms of inequality, and that's all important. I'm absolutely welcome, but we need more. At the end of the day, this work does not challenge the structural inequalities that many of these same institutions are com complicit in creating. Uh, and the work is, is not adequately calibrated to the power that we hold to affect change. Um, and so I think statements of support, increased diversity work, 
um, doing work to support people who are victims of this system don't do what we need to do to change the system. So I'm hopeful uh, that part of this conversation that we're having is going to move from addressing the symptoms to challenging the, the underlying structure. Mm -hmm. And one of the um, things that we know is happening is uh, demographic shifts. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, can you talk about just the anxieties related to that and how they might play into racial justice issues um, that we're seeing today? Yeah. Um, I, I think they're central to so much of what we've seen and experienced uh, this year. I teach at uh, NYU Law School, and I often ask my students to read an article called Whiteness is Property. It was an article published in the Harvard Law Review. Um, and in it, the author, Professor Cheryl Harrell, Harris, argues that the set of assumptions and privileges and benefits that accompany the status of being white have become a valuable asset. And that white people fight to protect that status as the asset uh, that it is. And we've seen this concept amplified on the national stage over the past several years as uh, more black people and other people of color not only enter traditionally white spaces and historically white spaces, but act like we belong in those spaces, take leadership roles in those spaces. We see um, white communities stand up to defend what they believe is their space and their privilege. And perhaps really no single act in recent history triggered that kind of white supremacy defense as the election of uh, Barack Obama um, and the conversations that we are having about getting closer and closer to people of color being a majority in America. So what was hap what happened on January 6th, um, what we're seeing in policing, particularly policing of uh, tr traditionally white spaces and the increase of living while black complaints, what we're seeing in voting rights, what we were seeing in immigration, um, and so much of uh, Trump's presidency was about race and white supremacy and reacting to and resisting a nation that's more diverse than has ever been. It, it was at the center of that insurrection, an attempt to disenfranchise black voters uh, and to brand our participation in this democracy as illegitimate. Uh, it started long before that day, but it was really um, an awakening for people who wanted to reclaim their democracy as their own. Um, to reclaim this country as their own. It includes efforts to end immigration by people of color. Um, it included the efforts to include a citizenship question on the census, the challenges to the use of race conscious admissions programs at storied historically white institutions like Yale and, and Harvard. Um, and it's in line with white backlash that has plagued American politics from its beginning. And I think it will only increase and get uh, worse as the face of America changes and the story of who America is changes and people um, react to feeling like they are being left out, being pushed out, um, that America is not the America that they once believed it to be. And and I imagine in some ways there's a recognition that um, that if if we didn't want to change before... <laughs> That that there we need to change. We need to make sure that we still have the customer. We need to make sure that we are attracting um, the people that we need into our businesses. Because I'm watching the shift of the conversation. What I think is happening around the demographic shift, right? Mm -hmm. So that it feels like layered on top of the issues of justice or the recognition of the way things have been won't continue. Right. right. So it feels like the demographic shift is actually forcing a conversation on top of the things that we're witnessing. That's a better That's way right. of saying it. Right. And I think it relates back to your first conversation, right? Uh, your first question about what's different now. Some of the demographic shifts have um, changed the, the way we engage in conversations about everything from top to bottom in, in this country. Um, the demographic shifts in who has leadership, the demographic shifts in who's um, in the White House, who um, who are who are member of con Congress, who are running institutions, who are running corporate America, who are leaders in our um, community institutions, all of those demographic shifts as well, absolutely are changing 
uh, the nature of the conversation. They are driving the conversation and changing what, um, how we define success and what success will look like at the end of the day. Yeah. We, um, Westminster Town Hall Forum and the Minneapolis Foundation, um, came together to uh, think, to bring uh, thinkers and experts to our city through this series um, as we um, come upon the one-year anniversary of George Floyd's death. And um, I am curious on when you witnessed um, that video, how it impacted you, and how your life has uh, been impacted, your life, your work has been impacted uh, since, since that moment. Mm-hmm. I actually really uh, quite vividly remember watching that video and feeling at first just numb and thinking here we are in the middle of a pandemic that is killing so many members of our community that is impacting us deeply and profoundly in economic ways. Uh, we are fighting for our lives, but still there was no respite, no break. Um, from the kind of police violence. And so I sat there first in disbelief uh, and then just with tears. Um, Tears for what this meant about just how far we had to go, how little progress we had made in so many areas uh, and tears what I knew this meant for us moving forward, for what this was going to mean for black people and, and black communities as we continue to move forward to try to make progress. Um, it has sh- certainly shaped my work over the past years. I hope it has shaped everyone's work for us to re-engage, to uh, really recommit with more urgency than we have ever before for organizations like the ACLU uh, that broadly fight for Uh, equality, kind of pushing to make sure that America lives up to its promises, uh, realizing that we had an obligation to deepen, to expand, to prioritize our racial justice work. Uh, And that's how I've spent the the past year, just, I think, going on um, on on everything, fighting for this world that I think we we deserve, fighting for the world that I think my children deserve. I want them Um, to be able to wake up in the morning and not worry over their children the way that I have to worry over over them. Uh, And they have motivated me. And I think after George Floyd and each incident that came after, again, there was disbelief. As the world was watching us, we were continuing to do the same old thing. As people were demanding accountability, demanding justice, we're taking to the streets. Uh, We were continuing to do the same old thing. As new conversations were happening in our communities, in corporate America, in our schools, in our other institutions, we were continuing to do the same old thing. And so I'm I'm, I'm still hopeful. I am hopeful that we have turned a corner. When I see those, those protests, people out there every day trying to demand progress, It makes me feel positive for our our, our future. I think the protests by people of color have always been a potent force to drive overdue reform and transformation. Um, It's a powerful reminder of the political power and the strength in our communities. I I remain hopeful because I'm blessed to be surrounded by young people. They give me energy because they are about this work. They are focused. Uh, They give me motivation because I want to help build a world that's worthy of them, worthy of my students, worthy of my children, worthy of the young activists uh, who I see out there every day, who I try to support uh, in my in my work. And I get hope from colleagues and partners like my colleagues at the ACLU because I see the fierceness and the love with which we are trying to pursue uh, justice every day. And, and so I'm taking from that awful moment as much strength and focus and determination as I can. Mm-hmm. Did you feel hope uh, when the verdict came back guilty? It's interesting. I, I don't know if I felt hope. 
Mm. I felt relief. I, I felt like I could breathe and had not realized that I was probably holding my breath for months um, uh, because I think in this country, we're not used to getting any measure of justice or accountability when it comes to racial violence, that that is just not uh, something that's happened throughout our history. Um, so I felt optimistic that maybe this was a sign of a shift because holding a former police officer accountable under these circumstances was is still unheard of in this country. It's just, um, it was historic in, in Minnesota. I And so certainly we should take hope. Uh, but I think the the kind of resistance and the ebbs and flows of progress and um, some of the resistance I see to conversations is making me concerned mm -hmm. um, that we won't take the next step from, the, from that verdict, that we won't continue to push forward, to move forward in a way that is going to more fundamentally transform our systems. Um, so I want to say I'm hopeful, um, but something's preventing me from saying I, I, I was hopeful, mm -hmm. but I was so happy, um, relieved. Yeah. Yeah, and um, we know that that was one officer that was held accountable for his actions. Um, it 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 made me feel hopeful that it could happen again. Okay. Um, but as we move forward, and you so eloquently laid out, there is much work to do. Um, do you have any? words of of advice or areas for our listeners that if I if you know for them to keep pressing on this issue what they might be paying attention to what they should be paying attention to so uh, uh, professor john powell has said that we can all be a part of the hum uh, the circle of human concern and so for your for the folks who are listening and thinking about these issues i think that means that we all have a role to play that we need to challenge not only our system of policing, but all the systems of inequality that feed into um, policing, that feed into inequality. It is a, it's a big systemic knot. So many things come together to create a moment where the police have the opportunity, authority, ability to dehumanize Black people in that way. And so I would encourage people, if engaging directly in policing reform is not the area for you, there are so many other ways to get at this systemic inequality to, as we've said, to challenge and tear down that structure of inequality. There is an ongoing fight on, on voting rights that is just disheartening and, um, just, and tragic and shows that there are some people who will do everything that they can to make sure um, that they hold on to power. They want to, they have the desire to hold on to power completely and indefinitely, granting access to others only when it serves their purpose. And so there's work to do there. There's work to do around segregation. Segregation has built so many, um, ch some of the challenges and issues that we see today because our systems of segregation have a tremendous negative impact on those who are left out because you can't separate the, pl the places that people have access to from the opportunities people have access to. Fight for economic justice. Economic justice and racial justice are two sides of the same coin. Economic justice work is critical because it supports our ability to access and enjoy our other civil rights uh, and other civil liberties. So there's so much work to do. That's just the, the um, you know, just the, the the tip, there's education work. All of these things are going to help challenge inequality to get us to a better, more just place. And so I hope people will find where they fit in, be they lawyers or artists, authors, filmmakers, um, to find a way in and to use your talent and your skills, your resources and your privilege to impact change. Mm -hmm. So Deborah, you're the first uh, black president of the ACLU in 101 years. And I imagine that that has um, been, you know, it's quite an accomplishment. And yet it's, you know, we're still sort of breaking that, that ceiling, um, which says a lot about the times that we're living in. How has that experience been? And um, what, what have you, what is that, what has that been like over the time, your tenure as president? It's been a, sh uh, a, a short tenure so far, but honestly, it's been a blessing. It's a milestone for the ACLU, but it's also an important personal milestone 
for me. The ACLU has actually been an important part of my professional life for about two and a half decades. And I started my legal career as a fellow with the ACLU way, way, way back, in large part because I'm passionate about the issues that the ACLU works on, many of which have uh, touched my life personally. My family is from Jamaica. I'm a first generation American citizen, first generation uh, college graduate, uh, grew up in one of the richest states in the country, Connecticut, and sometimes struggled financially, struggled against um, discrimination uh, because my parents were immigrants, because we were black. And, and serving as president of the board of the ACLU now during this time is really an honor and certainly the ultimate opportunity to both serve the ACLU and do the important work of um, furthering equality. And you, you mentioned um, being the first uh, black person and the significance of being the first black person to serve in this role is not lost on me. But to put it in context, in over a hundred years, the ACLU has only had seven other presidents. I am just the, the eighth. So of course there's a big part of me that is frustrated that in 2021, we're still tackling so many firsts for black women, for people of color, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm really proud uh, to be a part of, uh, of that history. I think um, when black people and black people in our community experience success in our lives, um, we often say that we are, are our ancestors' wildest dreams. And I believe that and I have felt that. Um, and all of these women that I have looked up to in my life, who I view as, uh, as mentors and um, have just really tried to model my career off of, off of theirs, have reached out to say congratulations. And that has been really powerful. And I think every time a Black woman achieves one, achieves one of these firsts, whether it's in uh, government or civic leadership or business or politics, it honors the Black women who have come before, the women who have fought and led and organized and survived so that this country could be more free, so that we could be in this place and that we could have this oppor opportunity to, to serve. And so to become president of the ACLU, particularly in this era where Black women continue to change the national landscape, uh, it, it, it really is an honor. And then I think I'll say one more thing in, in that I think the election holds importance for the ACLU as well. It adds another dimension to the 100 year story um, of, the, of the ACLU. I hope that my election will help people feel and believe that the ACLU represents all of America. Uh, we are now an organization where 60% of the members of our national board of directors identify as people of color. Um, we have 40% uh, of our leaders across our affiliates around the country identify as people of color. So I hope that after my election, more people will see themselves in the ACLU and look to us as an organization that's fighting for them as well. Mm -hmm. As you moved into that role, and I believe you you started in February, is that correct? I, yes. Yeah. Did you um, identify what you hoped your legacy of leadership would be during mm -hmm. your time? Yeah, I, I think, I hope that people will look back after um, my term is over and think that the ACLU rose to the moment in the way that we rose to the moment following the uh, election of President Trump. There really is so much at stake in our society right now. We've spent most of the past four years on the defensive, trying to stop efforts to roll back fundamental civil rights and civil liberties and challenging laws that targeted vulnerable and marginalized communities. Um, so moving forward, we have work to do to address that toxic legacy, but I also hope that we'll do more work um, to rebuild the communities that were hurt by the administration and to expand and deepen protections of, of important civil rights and civil liberties issues. And I hope to help the ACLU to do the work that I think so many organizations are doing to continue to push and evolve in who we are as an organization and make sure that we as an organization are living up to our values. Mm -hmm. Well, Deborah, I'm glad that you are bringing all of your uh, expertise and leadership uh, to the issues that uh, we care about in our community. 
Um, the work of the ACLU is critically important at a time like this. Um, we appreciate you being part of the speaker series with the Westminster Town Hall Forum and the Minneapolis Foundation. Um, and um, to our listening audience, thank you for listening. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you. Thank you for joining us at the Westminster Town Hall Forum. There are three other talks as part of our series, The Arc Toward Justice, taking stock one year after George Floyd's death. On our website, you can find the talk by Jelani Cobb, a writer for The New Yorker. There, you can also watch my conversation with the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago. In the final talk in our series, we will hear from two members of George Floyd's family, Angela Harrison, his aunt, and Paris Stevens, his cousin. Find out more about each of these programs on our website, westminsterforum.org. Once again, we'd like to thank our presenting sponsor for this series, the Minneapolis Foundation. Thanks also to the Polad Family Foundation for supporting production of these talks. And thanks to our media partners, Minnesota Public Radio, for recording and broadcasting these talks, as well as MinPost and Sahan Journal. Thank you. And please join us again at the Westminster Town Hall Forum.